I am very excited to be here this morning. For those of you that don't know me, I'm known as the big guy on staff. Uh, my name's Shane, and I'm the youth pastor here. And I get to spend time with the teens all week long. And it's exhausting. And um, now I get to spend time with you guys this morning, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And Chuck came to me a little while ago, and, and he had said that we were going through this series, Emmanuel, God with us, and, and speaking about Jesus and, and what the names that Jesus was given at birth. And uh, he kind of gave me the list of four, and I was humming and hawing, and then two of them got picked, and I'm like, oh, there's only two left, so I better pick one. And the one that spoke out to me the most is this. Let, let's read our scripture. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting <clears throat> Father, and Prince of Peace. And so I chose Prince of Peace, because it's something that speaks to me often. And here's, here's what I believe. In North America, I don't know if we understand what true peace is. That we live in such a busy world and, and such a busy time that... We, we talk about peace, but do we actually understand what it is? Have we experienced peace? Are you experiencing peace in your life right now? And so when I think of the scripture, and, and I like to think backwards, because I'm a guy and that's how we think. And if I'm thinking about peace, I need to think about what is stealing my peace? What is keeping me from actually having peace in my life? And, and I think it's this. I think it's anxiety. And we hear that word, and some of us hear that word, and we get tingles that go down our spine because we fear it. We're afraid of anxiety. Anxiety is one of those things that just is debilitating in our life, that many people struggle with, and you hear about it more and more every day, and, and younger and younger people dealing with anxiety. And, and I define anxiety as this. A feeling of, un oh, sorry, what is peace? <laughs> but anxiety is a feeling of uneasiness and worry. Are you uneasy this morning, today? Are you worried about something in your life? Because if you are, I'm hoping that this message is going to help you. And so I have to think about what was God's plan for us to live in peace. What, what was his design and how did he want us to live to be able to live in peace? And I think the first, my first point is, I think that he wanted us to live in community. And when I look at Jesus, and when I look at Jesus' ministry, and he was surrounded by the 12 misfits, I mean, the 12 disciples that were always around him, these, these 12 guys, that he constantly was doing ministry and living a faith-filled life in community with the people around him. When you have people that you can lean on and communicate with and have a relationship with and be open about what's going on in your life, anxiety is not as easy to run away. Right? When I have people in my life that I can just sit down and say, this is what's going on in my life right now, today. Can you pray for me? Can you spend time with me and just kind of talk me through it? Sometimes we just need somebody to let us vent. Someone that we can actually just talk to and say, you know, this is all the garbage that's going on in my life. And thank you for taking the time to listen. And so I was looking at the scripture in uh, Philippians. It's <clears throat> chapter 4 verse 6 to 7, and this is what it says. Do not be anxious about anything. Done. You guys can go home. The Bible says, don't be anxious about anything. We're good here, right? Easier said than done, right? So let's, let's continue. Scripture says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. 
I mean, don't be anxious about anything. I still, I still sit on that, and, and I know I, I talk to people in my life who are anxious, and I'm like, well, just stop. Just stop worrying. Stop thinking about that. The scripture says stop. So isn't that enough? But we know it's not. I think the first step, again, is us just having people around us that we can have conversations with and be honest with. So my first point is communion. My second point um, is this. <clears throat> I think that we need to begin to trust God. Do you trust God? What does it mean to actually trust God? What does it mean to really surrender my life and rely on him on a constant basis? And my third question for this is, are you living a life right now that requires you to trust God? I know that there have been times in my life and very few times in my life that I have been comfortable with where I'm at. That doesn't require me to trust God. I don't need to because things are going well in my life. And then there's those times in my life where everything around me is falling apart. There is... No sane reason that I should be okay. And it requires me to trust in God. Matthew 22, verse 34 and 40 says this. It says, <clears throat> Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law. I love it when it says an expert in something in the Bible. So this guy who's an expert in the law comes to Jesus and he says this. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Let me stop here. Okay. Often we read the Bible and we hear the questions that people ask Jesus and we think, wow, this person is not very smart. For being an expert in the law, why are you asking Jesus this question? But I look at this, and I'm like, wow, I can so relate to that person. Because even on a Sunday morning, I think sometimes we come to church, and we hear speakers up on the platform, and they give us all this information, and it's great information, but we want one thing. What can I take away from your message? What is that one thing that I can walk away with today and begin to apply to my life? And so Jesus was an amazing speaker, he had a lot of information, and people were interested to hear what he had to say, but people were always like, okay, that's all great, Jesus, but if I had to take one thing from that, what would it be? And now, Jesus responds, and I love Jesus' response, because it's never what you want it to be, and here's what it is. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So that's one thing. But Jesus answers the way that he wants to answer, and he says, and a second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the prophets hang on these two commandments. He asked for one answer, and Jesus gave him two. He said, that's, that's great that you want to know the one thing, but you have to understand that our lives are more complicated than just a one-sentence answer. There's more to life than just taking the least amount that you can from it. So here is the complete answer, and it comes from Jesus. So do you trust Jesus? Do you trust that he can guide you, that he can point you in the right direction? I, uh, I like funny things. I like comedy. Who here likes funny things? I love. And, and I find that kids often are the funniest things. The things that they say, and, and we have all these TV shows, like Kids Say the Darnest Things, and, and whatever it is, and I've been watching a video, um, and, and it's a Jimmy Kimmel video, where he asks two questions to kids, and they answer. And I just wanna share that video with you guys this morning to, to prove one of my points, so let's take a look at the screens. Seeing kids 
and, and their responses to questions that they don't actually have to deal with. And when I was watching this video, I, I began to think, for, for those of you that don't know, I do have four kids. I have uh, a 20-month-old, I have a three-year-old, I have a six-year-old, and I have a seven-year-old. And this is why preaching on peace is very difficult for me. Um, but I, I love my kids, and, and I began to think, you know, what if I came home from work one day, and my oldest, Paige, who's seven, came running up to me and was really stressed out and said, Daddy, Daddy, did you pay the mortgage this month? Yes, honey, you don't have to worry about that. Don't worry. That's... But do you make enough at work to be able to cover the mortgage and buy groceries and put gas in the vehicle and to be able to pay the bills? Honey, yes, like, go play with Barbies, please. Just go worry about what you need to worry about. And, and what if she was so stressed out? Well, what if you lost your job? Then what, we would, what, what would we do? I'm just thinking, I, I, I would just have to tell her, like, honey, I am a good dad. And I want to do everything I possibly can to take care of you. And you don't have to worry because I will do everything in my power to make sure that you are taken care of because I love you. I think a lot of you can see where I'm going with this is that we have a good father. And sometimes I, I think he looks down on us as his children. And he sees us worrying about things. He sees us stressing about things in our life and, and having difficulties and, and not knowing what's next. What if? What if this? What if that? And he says, don't worry. I am a good father. And I love you. And I believe that he wants to take care of every one of us. Do we trust that God loves us? Do we trust that he is a good father? Do we trust that he will care for us? Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 to 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. Trust in God with all my heart. But I think the next part is difficult for me sometimes. And lean not on your own understanding. Not what I know, not what I can do, not my own ability, but I really have to trust in him. See, it's like, he is the director above. He can see our paths. He can see what is to come, and we can't. We can't see what's coming up. So we need to trust in him to guide us where we need to go. It's my second point. Trust. My third point is this. We need to be present. And not a present like I'm wrapping myself up and putting myself under the Christmas tree because I'm a gift to my family. We need to be present in the moment. Living here, living now, and seeing the people that are all around us. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34 says this. I love the title of this. It says, do not worry. <laughs> All over in here, guys. Just open it up. Read it. Verse 25 says this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body. What you will wear is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds in the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? 
Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers in the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And I love the end of this scripture. It's almost giving today and tomorrow a persona, right? An identity. Don't worry about what's coming up. That's God's job. Worry about right now. Because the only thing that you are promised in life is right now. None of us are promised tomorrow. And sometimes that is a scary thing to think about, which brings anxiety. Worry about what's going on in your life right now. Worry about the people in your life right now. You know, I, I, I love video games, and I think that that's youth ministry. I'll blame it on that. But I love playing video games, and some of the video games that I enjoy playing are are historic war games. And it's, it's an interesting aspect, and I've never had to live through a war to understand, a, a, a real war, let's get serious, um, to understand what that's actually like. And, and it's something that's always interests me, and it's something that's always interests me, is war tactics. That if you are thinking about the enemy and how to destroy them, that you have to start thinking like the enemy. Right? So... If we are living in peace, and if there's an enemy, they would have to begin to think, what can I do to start tripping you up from your peace in your life? And so if I'm telling you that a great way to have peace and to battle anxiety is to live in community, is to trust God, and to be present in the moment, If I were to attack those three things, that would be an effective war strategy. Would you agree? And so, I'm going to ask you a question, and please don't take this the wrong way, but I heard a minister ask this one time, and and I've started to think that if you were Satan, what would you do to steal God's peace from people? What kind of a culture would you create that would rob people of peace? And here's something that I think that we need to realize is our culture today. First thing, because of mobility, because of vehicles, we live where we didn't grow up. Many of us, not some of us still live where we grew up, but often we go to school, we get a degree, We get training, and we move to wherever that training takes us. Second thing, that we're working where we don't live. How many commuters here? Anybody? Anybody commute to work? A few. Often, people commute 20, 30, 40 minutes out of the community where they live to make ends meet, to find a job that worked for them. The last thing is this, and this is something, as a youth pastor, I am struggling with, with this generation, big time. And it's this, that the devices that were marketed to connect us have connected us with images of people we cannot see, but separate us from those around us. Again, having four kids, my wife and I don't get out very much. 
But luckily, we have an amazing youth group of babysitters that like our kids. And I know one night, Katie and I wanted to go out on a date, and so we did. They came over, watched our kids. And we went to uh, Jose's, which when I was growing up, used to be called Jose's Noodle Factory. It is not, it is now called Jose's, because that's cool. And so we go in and we're sitting at the table and, and we're talking. And I took a second and looked around the restaurant and saw everybody sitting at the tables and nobody was looking at each other. Everybody was looking down at their phones. And I remember thinking, I don't get to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with my wife. And I want to. I want to take that time and just be present with the person that is in front of me. How often are you having a conversation with somebody and they look down at their phone and send a quick text message in the middle of a conversation? How many times are you talking with somebody and their phone rings and they take that phone call? I know I'm guilty of it. And I think that the message sometimes that we send to other people is that whatever's going on here is more important than the time that I'm spending with you. And we begin to think smaller of ourselves. We begin to think that we are not the most important thing in someone else's life. The time that we take is very important. And I always hear from people, I'm, I'm too busy for this, I'm too busy for that. And I tell people the same thing every time, that you make time for what's most important in your life. If your phone is the most important thing in your life, you will make time to be on your phone. But if your family, your spouse, your kids are the most important thing in your life, you will make time for them. Sorry if I'm stepping on any toes, but I really feel very passionately about that, that we have to be careful about what we are doing in the moment, in this time, where we are right now. So, I've talked about community, I've talked about trust, and I've talked about peace. We've talked about our culture and, and what we go through. And I want to kind of go back to the scripture that we, we talked about before, and that's Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. And I want to read it again, but emphasize something a little bit different here. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want, I want to focus this part. Transcends all understanding. What does that mean? When it's talking about the peace that God can bring to us, isn't this frustrating, almost? That the peace that God wants to give us transcends our understanding. It's beyond us. That we can't understand it. We can't obtain it. And I think that there is a key point here. And it's this. Often in our lives, we pursue peace. That we want that tranquility in life. We want to feel good. We want to be comfortable. And when we are pursuing peace and not obtaining it, we're stressing ourselves out more. What this scripture tells us is don't pursue peace. Don't do it because it transcends our understanding. So instead, through prayer, petition, thanksgiving, present our request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will be given to you. So don't pursue peace. Pursue Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace. And when we start focusing on God, when we start praying, when we start taking our relationship with him seriously, trusting him, living in community, being present even with God in our relationship, then peace will come to us. 
So the last part that I want to leave for you, and then I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up, is don't pursue peace, because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And when we pursue him, then we will receive peace. Let me pray, and I'm going to hand it over to my best friend here, Karen. Father, I thank you for this morning, and, and I thank you for the opportunity to come and share something that you've put on my heart. And I know where we are at in this season of life, at Christmas time, people are robbed of peace daily. I know that in North America, we deal with anxiety in a way that the rest of the world might not. And I pray that you begin to reveal to us the path and the steps that we need to take to find your peace, to seek you first, and then peace be given to us. I thank you. In Jesus' name, 